I'm Amy Pruitt. I'm Lisa Dumas. I teach Ayurveda and yoga. I teach yoga. I'm a yoga therapist in training, and I offer transformational coaching. But that's just part of the story. We're moms, daughters, wives, and friends. We're always learning, and we've both experienced healing by what we teach. And the intention of this podcast is to offer you our favorite tools from the traditions and sciences that support us as we navigate the realities and stressors of modern life. Each week, we'll share stories, answer your questions, and talk to others who inspire us. Welcome to the Radiant Warrior Podcast. Yoga and Ayurveda to reclaim a courageous heart. So Amy, when you run into somebody and you haven't talked to them in a long time and you ask them how they're doing, what is a typical response you might get? I'm so busy. Yeah, I can absolutely relate. And and I can also relate to answering that way. And over the weekend, I went to a workshop with Janet Stone. And in fact, she's teaching in response to this epidemic of busy by teaching a lot more of a down-regulating sequence, which was interesting. And she said something that made us all laugh because she said, can you imagine if you ask somebody, you know, hey, what's going on? What have you been doing? And they said, uh, nothing, just <laughs> hanging around. Laying around. Not really achieving anything. Yeah, that would be quite the opposite of how people answer usually. I know. So on this episode, we're going to talk about what stops us from taking time out and resting, how to hack into some of the thoughts and beliefs that we have around that. And you may wonder, you know, some of the things that we talk about, what does this have to do with yoga and Ayurveda? But when you've committed to a yoga practice for a lot of years or a meditation practice, anything that turns your gaze inward, you really start to learn a lot about yourself and you start to learn a lot about your beliefs and the thoughts you have about pretty much everything. And you start to hear all your own excuses, don't you? Oh, totally. What stops you from just allowing yourself to rest? Well, I think that's, I think that's it. I'm not allowed to rest stops me. And then there are a million different reasons why I'm not allowed to rest there's so much more to do. There's so much more I have to do. I could do more, be more, earn more. You know, I haven't earned the right to rest that, you know, that will come at another time. And then we get to the point where we're so exhausted because we've been putting it off, putting off the rest. And I think you hit a thought that so many people share and that is, well, I have to earn it. How do you even quantify that? Because we're having the thoughts, but the harder step is to then get in there and really question those thoughts. When did we first learn that? Do we really believe that? Does that work for us? Who would we be if we didn't have that thought? But I think most of us have some version of, well, I have to earn it. My version that I grew up with was, you have to earn your beer. (laughs) (laughs) That gives you you a little little window. (laughs) Yeah. How do you earn beer? (laughs) You make sure that you have run a certain amount of miles, that you have worked out a certain amount, that you have done a certain amount of the housework, that you have earned your paycheck, that you have taken care of your responsibilities, that you have done every single thing on your to-do list. And then if there's that space at the end of the day, you collapse on the couch and that's, you know, you've earned that rest. But I think that that's what so many of us feel. I know that many of the clients that I'm working with these days, they're coming to me specifically because they want to learn a different way. And so much of this is in our mind. Yes, we're busy. I mean, it's it's true. We've got jobs. We've got kids. We've got families. Our kids have activities. It's true. Our schedules can be busy. But I would say it's probably more true that our minds are busy telling us everything we have to do. And that's the exhausting part. Yeah. I know for me, I, that's one of my biggest downfalls is not giving myself permission ever. I agree. I would say what keeps me from resting is the guilt that I have about resting. Who am I to take this time to have an afternoon nap when so many people are working so much harder in this moment? Who am I to deserve it is a big thought that comes up for me. And recently in a class, that was something that I taught. It was like I felt this collective sigh of relief in the room because 
I was considering the possibility that maybe we don't have to earn it. Now, this is not to say that we don't take care of our shit, that we don't take care of our responsibilities. We're not talking about procrastination here. But what if we didn't have to earn it? What if we flipped that thought and we came to our lives from this place of deserving, receiving rest, and even receiving pleasure as a gift, as something that we just innately deserve? What if we thought that? I think that would feel uncomfortable to begin with. It would take practice. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think it goes farther back than even like our upbringing. You know, I think it's cultural and, um, you know, going back for probably, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years that your survival depended on you to keep going. It's true. And so many of us are completely out of balance And you mentioned we wear this label busy, like it's a badge of honor. Like, I think I might even be embarrassed if you called me and I actually had allowed myself to take a nap and you said, what were you doing? (laughs) Would I be honest enough to say, oh, just napping? I don't know. (laughs) I'd like to think that I am, but I will share this. You know, I've shared here that I'm in recovery from 15 years with an anxiety disorder And about 10 years ago, when I was able to shift that and I was able to heal from having chronic panic attacks and go from feeling really fearful all the time to feeling so surprisingly content and calm, I didn't stop to repair any of the damage that had been done. I was just so excited that I could finally live and that I got even more committed to to yoga and meditation, and then more committed to wanting to share it, and then more trainings and more classes and more workshops, just more, 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 more. And it's almost like I've been wanting to make up for lost time. But what I'm discovering through different appointments and different information that's coming to me from different health and wellness practitioners is that, you know, I'm very tired. I am, I am. I have a lack of energy that I previously haven't experienced. And it seems as though I've got to do something about it. And I have to take some time to do some restoration. But I'm going to have to find a way to allow that. I'm going to have to find a way to take a nap or take a pause or set something aside for later without all the guilt, because it's the guilt and the shame that that's not allowing me any sort of rest that's useful. How do you think you'll do that? Like practically, what does that look like? Hacking into those thoughts, you know, asking myself, how does this thought of, well, have you earned this rest yet? Have you done enough yet? Because if I was going to go further into that line of thought, what's enough? Am I ever going to decide that I've done enough to deserve a rest? Sometimes, sometimes, and I'm getting better. But I think the allowing, I think the the flip of shifting into receptivity, it's such a habit, it's such an addiction to be in doing and achieving mode. And and just what you said, it's in our wiring as well. And maybe there's this fear that if I really let myself completely slow down, maybe there's this fear that I might not, like I might not get back up. I mean, I know that's not true, but there is a deep fear with me that I won't realize the dreams that I have for my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think in those years when I was so anxious all the time, I think there was a a habit of procrastination going on there just as a survival mechanism almost. Yeah, there seems to be, a for me, a fear of being left behind if I'm not hustling just as hard as everyone else or as I perceive everyone else to be hustling, that I'll be left in the dust or that I'll be left without, you know, that there won't be anything left for me if... I'm not working just as hard or harder than those around me, Um, which is silly. Whatever they're doing has nothing to do with me, but I feel like 
they're moving faster than I am and they're all passing me by. I think then this age of social media, that that is making busy even more attractive because let's face it, let's say we take some time to rest. A lot of us might equate that rest to scrolling on the phone. It is a hard habit to break. And even though we might know logically that the pictures that we're looking at are the highlight reels of the people that are out there, it's you still have this unconscious or, or conscious thought of, look what everybody else is doing. And I, I'm just sitting here, what, what am I achieving in this moment? I guess you can call that FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. Yeah. I I have something about FOMO. Um, I shared this on my Instagram page. <laughs> 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 I discovered this when I was scrolling one day. <laughs> when you were resting. <laughs> but this is something that Brene Brown shared. Actually, this did help me shift the fear of missing out. When I was younger, I had this a lot. And when my daughter Grace was younger, I had this a lot. When I found out what, you know, what activities the other kids were doing, I thought that I had to somehow keep up to measure up as a mother. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Brene writes here, don't let FOMO kill your mojo. So don't let the fear of missing out kill your mojo. She says, The fear of missing out is what happens when scarcity slams into shame. Mm -hmm. FOMO lures us out of our integrity with whispers about what we could or should be doing. FOMO's favorite weapon is comparison. It kills gratitude and replaces it with not enough. We answer FOMO's call by saying yes when we mean no. We abandon our path and our boundaries and those precious adventures that hold meaning for us so that we can prove that we aren't missing out. But we are. We're missing out on our own lives. Every time we say yes because we're afraid of missing out, we say no to something. That something may be a big dream or a short nap. We need both. Courage to stay our course and gratitude for our path will keep us grounded and guide us home. That Brene, man, she knows her shit. So there's not to say that there can't be wisdom gained and and great information learned from social media. But Mm -hmm. that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when you went on for a specific purpose and all of a sudden two hours have gone by. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, or 20 years. Yeah. So you, with this history of burnout, with a belief of I have to earn it and work more and learn more and make more, Mm -hmm. you did come to the end of the rope. You've shared that on here. So what does that look like now with the awareness of I need rest? How do you allow yourself to rest or, or have you gotten any better at that? I'm, I'm not great at it. <laughs> um, I am getting better at it though. I, I have to schedule it. I have to be very intentional because if I wait for the feeling to come along, I'm never, I can't say I'm never, but I'm likely not to allow myself spontaneous rest. So I have to put it on the calendar, you know, as marking out days off that nothing can be scheduled, scheduling my time away from work, whether it's asking for specific long weekends or using my vacation time, because I see that all around me that nobody uses their vacation time, being better about planning just time away you know, even if it's, even if we're not going anywhere, we could have a staycation, Mm -hmm. but actually using that time up, there is a definitely a badge of honor with people saying, Oh, I've got 300 hours of vacation time saved up. I'm like, why wouldn't you use that? Like, what are you saving that for? Like death? You know, I want to use it all and I'm not great at it either, but I have to be very intentional about just requesting off time away, even if I don't have any plans. Um, So for me, it has to be in the calendar, um, written in pen. You know, I'm pushing it a little bit right now. Like I can feel it that I'm, I'm doing too much right now. And I've had long conversations with myself that I'm going in the wrong direction. You know, I'm, I'm doing too much and the things I'm doing, I enjoy. I enjoy my work right now and I enjoy teaching yoga right now and I enjoy seeing clients right now. And I am 
going to do these big trainings this year. So they're all very inspiring things, but they take a lot of time. And I don't have a lot of free time and I can feel it. I've had to have a lot of long heart to heart conversations with myself that coming up when this series of yoga classes that I'm teaching right now, when they come to an end, I'm not going to put another one on the books for a little while and give myself time to do these trainings without just adding another thing to my plate. But as I add something, I have to take something else off. That's what that looks like right now. And I don't want to not teach these classes because I love my students and I love what I'm doing. But I also know that I'm, I'm stretching myself a little bit thin and I don't, I don't want to be back in that place of not enjoying every day. What you're talking about too, is one of the downfalls of the life of an entrepreneur. And I can relate there. Everything is inspiring classes and clients and trainings, but you're right. It's, there's not that cutoff point. There's never the closing bell, the punching out of the clock, leave it all behind. I could do it at all hours of the night. If something needed to be done, if studying needed to be done, there's nothing saying, well, it's not the time for that. Now it's the time for rest. That's all up to me. Mm -hmm. And then that's where all those thoughts hit me that even if I do rest, it's like I'm not really enjoying it or getting the most out of it because I'm telling myself that I'm somehow bad or wrong or non-deserving of it. So that awareness is good. But then what do we do when we meet those thoughts? That's when we have to question them. And that's when we have to say, how is this thought serving me? Is this thought coming from a place of love? Or as the Brene Brown quote just so beautifully suggested, is this thought coming from a place of some deep unworthiness and some shame? And we know that if thoughts are coming from fear, then love isn't present, meaning self-care isn't present, meaning real, true, deep restoration can't be present. So it's a harder road, strangely, to be kinder to ourselves and allow ourselves that nap. But it's something that I know for myself, and that's that's the only person I can speak for, is I've got to start to be able to have those thoughts override. Mm, I don't know if you've earned this yet. I'm not sure if you deserve this rest. Do you have that thought, I haven't earned it, around other areas of your life? Oh, yes. Uh, I have to earn it would be like a like a treat or doing something nice for my body, taking an afternoon off where I might go and get some body work done. Those special um, moments of self-care, they might go all the way down the list. But I'm starting to get a little bit better with that because unfortunately, we get to these times when we have to do something different. And I wish it wasn't that way. I wish we didn't have to come to exhaustion. But As I mentioned, at times I'm feeling that. We have to come to a place that forces us to learn. And this is making me think of a recent client who, same thing, you know, she's got a big job, she's got a family, and her kids have activities, and she has a lot of roles around the house. And so she really doesn't have a ton of time in order to practice self-care, in order to rest. And so I thought we might ping pong some ideas together that people could use when you just have maybe five or 10 minutes, how do you really restore rather than getting to the place of exhaustion and Netflix comes on. And we've also heard that even that as much as nothing is probably ever going to stop me from having that in my life, that can sometimes exhaust us even more. You know, one thing that comes to mind for me is appreciating or loving my body. When I, have moments where I'm like, I really love my body. Like I love, you know, I appreciate it. And it, I just think it's a miracle and it's just, you know, then I have the thought, but you know, we're so taught in the society that it's not okay to love your body until you change it. So you change your weight or you, you know, like looking at whether my roots have been done on my hair or, 
you know, if I've got makeup on or not, or if my wrinkles are showing or like looking at my chin, there's all these buts that I could add like, oh, I love my body, but I would like to change this or change that or having this unconditional love. I haven't earned that. You know, that thought comes into my mind. Like I haven't earned it until I've lost 10 pounds or I haven't earned the right to really love my body until my hair is done and my makeup's done. And, you know, I hear that from other people too, the way that they talk about their physical appearance or their body or their age or whatever that, you know, they haven't earned the right to just really unconditionally love themselves or appreciate the body that they live in. So I don't know if that is another area of, I have to earn it that you can relate to at all. I can. And especially in the past, I can relate with, I have to earn like a treat when it comes to food by fitting into certain clothes you know, or feeling good about my body or having eaten clean for a certain amount. And then I get to earn something that's, that's like a quote unquote bad food. That's, that's mm-hmm. definitely another thought around earning something that I have. Like restricting in a way so that you can reward yourself later or earn it in a way, you know, you've deprived yourself of something. So now you've earned it. Yeah. This is the thought flip that I'm really interested in cultivating. And that is shifting away from having to earn it to deserving it already. Mm -hmm. That was a big topic of the women's retreat that I recently went on. And our teacher was suggesting that how much can you receive as though it's a gift for your pleasure from your breath to your surroundings to the smiles of your family to time with friends to the scent of whatever is baking to the scent of the air how much of your life can you completely and presently receive as a gift just because you're deserving of that that in itself was a really wild lesson I've never been taught that before. Yeah, I don't think most people are. So what do we think is real nurturing, nourishing rest? Well, I'm a huge sleep advocate. Um, You and I have talked about that before. I am pretty militant about sleep. And that's the first place that I find when I'm really have gone off the tracks that I start my activities or my sleep becomes disruptive. And that is a huge no for me. That's a hard stop for me. And by sleep, I mean my whole sleep routine. Like I have a pretty, um, I sleep at least eight hours a night and go to bed and wake up at the same time, usually every day. I don't tend to deprive myself of sleep. Now, downtime, I I do deprive myself of downtime, but sleep, I do not. How deeply that affects people when they don't get enough rest or enough sleep is just, it amazes me that it is not given such a high priority in our world. Well, that's a huge problem. When we're go, 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 busy thinking, when our nervous systems are always in some low grade level of fight or flight, it can be a challenge to sleep. I'm sure you hear this all the time. I used to live this and now I hear this all the time that people have troubles falling asleep or staying asleep because the nervous system is dysregulated. It's been in fight or flight so often that it's hard to shift into that rest and digest time. And so rest, good quality rest without the phone And without any other stimulation is so important so that we can rebalance our nervous system. And this is really the secret of what's going on. When we are resting, yet we're having thoughts that are stressing us out, that's not going to do it. We've got to train ourselves that we deserve it somehow. We've got to be able to hack into those thoughts and realize the importance of, as you say, downtime because our sleep does depend on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we go, we fill every hour, every minute of the day. And then when it's bedtime, we expect to fall into bed, close our eyes and go right to sleep. And, you know, like you said, our nervous system is so overwrought with all the ideas and thoughts and activities that there's no way that you could just instantaneously shut it off as you fall into bed. 
And then when we can't get right to sleep, there's the stress of not sleeping and the stress of it being three o'clock in the morning and counting down the hours until we need to wake up. It, it is a real vicious and, and honestly a horrific cycle to be in. That is one of the reasons why I am so militant about my sleep is I don't want to be back in those cycles again. It's, it's just, it, it affects every aspect of your life. I mean, according to Ayurveda, there are three pillars to health and sleep is one of the three pillars to health that your whole health depends on sleep. And if you're not sleeping, you're not going to have the vitality and the vibrancy and it creates disease in the body. I mean, ultimately, if you're not sleeping, you're not healing and you're not repairing. So yes, according to Ayurveda, it is, it is vital that you get good quality sleep. So a typical day, I'd say for, for most people, and I've fallen into this trap and it's something that I have to work with every day is waking up first thing in the morning, alarm goes off, maybe phone goes in hand or mine goes immediately to everything that we have to do and then nervous system flips on and we're off to the races. So I think we've got to start right there in that moment. We've talked about great morning rituals in order to have a, a better day but we can still have full and exciting lives and we can take little moments in each day in order to turn parasympathetic system on in order to rebalance the nervous system. And it's, there's, it's simple. It doesn't have to be a lavish day at the spa. It can be five minutes where you're deepening your breath and you're really relaxing because when we are go, 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 and the mind is go, 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 that, breath isn't going to be full. The breath is going to be shallow and that will further dysregulate the nervous system. So, so many breathing breaks throughout the day, just pausing, relaxing the belly and allowing yourself to watch your breath and savor the longest breaths you can. For myself, I know eating in silence allows me an intentional time to allow the parasympathetic to activate. You know, we so often eat on the go, we eat while we drive, we eat with a lot of conversation or activity, or even, you know, our meals can be emotionally charged. And just allowing yourself your meal times to eat in silence has been a huge shift for me in resetting throughout the day, little areas, little pockets of time where I can turn things down a little bit and rejuvenate and restore. Um, Knowing that I eat at regular times, those are regular intervals where I can, I can get quiet and rest and restore. And you're mentioning something that is so important for balancing the dosha that can be imbalanced when we're feeling a lot of stress and we're feeling the go, go, go and the do, do, do. And that's the dosha of vata, the element of air or ether, this mobile quality that has us feeling scattered and turbulent in our mind. And that really responds and is pacified by structure and schedules Mm-hmm. Routine, predictability. Vata is the king of doshas. If all else fails, Vata will push the other doshas out of balance. Um, so you're always wanting to keep an eye on on the Vata dosha and pacifying it with regular routines and structure, like you said, and predictability. Vata is the mischief maker of the doshas. Yeah, that's what's so interesting. So somebody that was predominantly pitta, for instance, or whatever your dosha happens to be, when vata is up, which means more worry, more in the mind, maybe more creativity, maybe less sleep, more movement, it can push your other doshas. So if you do happen to be pitta, somebody who's fiery and determined, and you might be, somebody might describe you as type A, always on the go, But then once vata gets a little out of balance there, it can push that pitta. And then when pitta is pushed, it's not just stress, then it can move towards irritation and anger. We can feel really unbalanced. Mm -hmm. Irritability. And then you're really not sleeping because now you're worried and irritable. 
So yeah, Vata is the Vata is the king of doshas. It's definitely the one that should be pacified to be paid attention to. With structure, with regularity, with opportunities to ground. And we're talking about exactly how I ended up stumbling into an opportunity to heal chronic anxiety and chronic panic, which that's an example of deranged Vata for sure. Vata on the loose made a lot of mischief with me for many years. But what I didn't realize is when you practice regular Hatha yoga, when you're practicing regular deep breathing and especially being present, that is grounding that quality. And Mm -hmm. that's something that the quality of air and ether really needs is to be brought down to the present moment. Yeah. And our society in general creates vata derangement. I mean, we are always stimulated. We have our phones. We're constantly checking our social media or email or answering texts or, you know, we carry these phones and there are many computers. We can look at the news. We can read books on them. We can um, talk to our friends. We can FaceTime the news, the state of the world, the amount of work that we might be required to do, all of it is overstimulating and vata aggravating. Like we started with this podcast talking about how we don't give ourselves permission to rest. As a society, we don't. And all of our societal activities, our relationships, we, you know, losing our connection to nature Um, All of those things are vata aggravating. We're not, as a society, giving each other permission to do less, to be less, to produce less, which is all in itself vata aggravating. I like that I'm hearing these conversations a lot. I like that the yin classes at the yoga studios are the ones that are the most full. I like that the yin trainings that go on here in Vancouver with um, Bernie Clark, they are always packed. Uh, I do like that a teacher like Janet Stone, who's typically taught powerful vinyasa classes, is now coming out with a restorative sequence. Mm-hmm. So it's things are looking up. We are getting to a point where we know we have to make changes because so many of us are struggling with overwhelm and exhaustion and sleeplessness, as we've discussed. It's not like you have to make huge changes either. There can be a real shift between accomplishing a task from a place of rushing to get it done so we can just have a moment to ourselves and feeling resentful about what we're doing, about doing these dishes or picking up these clothes or doing this load of laundry rather than allowing ourselves to be fully immersed in the task at hand. This is something that I think some might be surprised with how restoring this can be. But the act of cleaning your car and you decide to be very present with every movement of your hand, with the task of taking something that was once unclean and making it clean, If you allow yourself to be completely present when washing the dishes, you know, the smell of the soap and the feel of the water, and also the gratitude of the abundance that we have, that we have these dishes to wash, that we have that food in the fridge, that can shift what once was a tiresome task that just took more of our precious energy that we don't have into a wellspring of energy. Because this is something that I stumbled upon as well within my yoga practice. I didn't know what it meant to be present, but I found this to be one of the most vital vital practices in my life is again and again, the practice of coming back to what's right here right now, because when I am fully present, and that means just allowing those thoughts that tell me maybe I haven't earned this nap, or I don't deserve this rest, allowing them, noticing, remembering they're not me, remembering that they're not my fault that they're there, that we all have them because we've all internalized them. And and there's lots of reasons why we've internalized them. There's lots of reasons that thoughts like that have also helped us in our lives. But being present and watching those thoughts rather than reacting to them and experiencing the environment around me, experiencing my breath, 
it's in those moments where I start to feel almost an injection of renewal. And yoga teaches that, you know, and and as does Ayurveda, we are made of prana, the Sanskrit term for universal life force. It's in us. It animates everything. It's in everything. And it's constantly there and it's constantly renewable. We can always recharge it. We don't have to worry about running out, but we have to take the time in order to be present, to find our breath to soften our jaw and shoulders and bellies so that we can access it because it's always there for us. Yeah, I love how you just described all of that, that all, all of that is already right there, like you said. And that was a beautiful description of, of something that's accessible to everybody right now. Yeah, again, something that we don't learn. We, we come to a reason that we have to learn. And I mentioned before that that's why I can actually say I feel grateful now for those years of anxiousness because it forced me to find something that would offer me some inner resources in order to help me heal. But I can't say enough about finding practices that bring you home to right here, right now, this this wellspring of creativity and inspiration, because that's something else that I think gives us restoration is when we're inspired, when we're feeling creative, right? When we're in the flow. So we've talked about different ways in which we can take a short time away from our schedules in order to restore ourselves. I love your idea of actually scheduling it through the day. I think that would work for a lot of people. And also prioritizing, we are very attached to achievement. And again, that's kept us propelling the art of striving and keeps us realizing our dreams. But what if we also saw going to a yin class or doing 10 minutes of meditation or a 15-minute yoga nidra or a short nap or an incredibly nutritious lunch in silence so that our body has full time to digest? What if we thought that was the highest achievement and such a high goal? Yeah, I congratulated each other on it, gave each other medals and awards and plaques for it. How long did you nap today, Amy? Wow. Oh my God, you're amazing. <laughs> you nap so hard. <laughs> <laughs> that, that kind of shift, and just even thinking about making a shift and questioning the thoughts that we have, it's all so helpful. Mm, totally. I have one tip that I do um, give my clients when they tell me that they struggle with rest or sleep that I would like to offer. Putting your phone out of your reach when, especially in the bedroom, people, I believe, take their phones to bed with them or they put them on the nightstand because they say it's their alarm or they say, well, I need to, what if there's an emergency? And what if somebody calls? You and I are of an age where the phones were attached to the wall when we grew up. So that didn't seem to be an issue back then. You know, we knew where the phone was if, we, if there was an emergency and we had alarm clocks or clocks that we used and somehow we woke up every day. And so I think there is an unconscious action of reaching for your phone, you know, as soon as your eyes open and that could be throughout the night, even um, reaching for your phone looking to see if somebody texted, Um, all of a sudden you're scrolling social media, oh, you're looking at this video and it's your sleep becomes so disruptive or your downtime now is you're lost in this vacuum of information with your phone. So, I mean, I challenge people who come to see me when um, they talk about how they're not resting or sleeping to put their phone, even on the other side of the bedroom, put it on the table across the room and set your alarm. There are apps that you can put on your phone that turn it into a clock at night. So you could see the clock on your phone, even if it's a clock across the room, but not having it right where your hand can pick it up can change everything about your downtime or your sleep if you're not physically attached to your phone. Mm-hmm. That phone gives me a lot of anxiousness and worry because I've got a 16 year old at home Mm -hmm. 
And every intention that I had when she was little about how, oh, I'm, my daughter's not going to spend all of her time on that phone, that, that just went out the window because you just have to pick your battles at some point. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you have to think the thought that, okay, she's on her own journey and her, she'll experience the consequences of having that addiction with the phone and be looking at that phone for so many hours a day. That that's that's also a worry that I've had to let go of because that would keep me up at night thinking about <laughs> her up at night on her phone. Yeah. Well, you can only you can only model, you know, that behavior for her. She, ha- like you said, she has to learn it on her own, and she would see you doing it and the results that you have, good or bad, with your phone, and that's all you can do. Absolutely. I say that to myself every day. I look in the mirror and say, all you can do is be the person that perhaps you you would hope to teach her to be. All you can do is take care of your side of the fence. So I, I agree wholeheartedly and it gives me peace for a moment, but it's certainly something that I have to work at when you know everything you know about the dangers of text neck. And, and there's so many things that we don't know about, as you said, all the stimulation that we're receiving most of the hours of the day. You know, we're just not built for this. We haven't evolved for this. So there's so much that we don't know about what might occur from this. And I, and I think that a lot of parents of teenagers can probably relate with this, with this kind of underlying worry that is always with me. You know, what have I, what have I put in my child's hands and anything that we've tried to do around rules and regulations and restrictions that that has not worked for us. It's not working for adults either to ask an adult to even put their phone across the room while they sleep is like asking them to cut off their hand. You know, it's just (laughs) a very uncomfortable thing to ask them to do but it can make a world of difference in the quality of their sleep and their rest and their energy throughout the day. But it's a huge hurdle to ask people to do of any age. And as someone who has a morning practice that is so important to me because it's, it's, it saves me, it, it, it helps me so much. It, it saved me from all of those years of anxiousness. If I do pick up my phone before the practice, sometimes so much time goes by that I might not even have the time that I normally would have had. Like I'm, I steal my practice from myself if I pick up the phone first. So it's really important for me not to pick up the phone until I've already taken care of myself. And that is one of my strong boundaries. It doesn't mean that I always get there, but it's a pretty strong rule that I have for myself that I make sure I do all the things that are going to help me feel as best as I can and show up to myself and my family as best as I can before I turn on that phone. Because you're right, you never know what you'll find. And we place a lot of importance on what people want from us there and how much time has to go by before we text back or email back. And you never know what you'll find. So I think it's, if you can take care of yourself first before picking it up. You know, some other really simple things that I think we can do even in the midst of a busy day is to maybe even first thing in the morning, make it a priority and ask ourselves, okay, what could I do today to give myself a little pleasure, to give myself a little rest? And it might be, as you said, taking some time to connect with nature. It doesn't have to be a long walk. It could be five or 10 minutes just getting out there, moving the body, taking some time to connect with a friend and sharing a laugh, or even for people who are working all day and in the car, instead of having the news on, I know that you really love quiet in the car, but for some people, I know that I don't listen to as much music as I used to listen to now that there's podcasts and 24-hour news cycles. and it makes me feel so great when I put on one of my favorite songs. Yeah. I I mean, I am very inspired by music too. And as much as I like silence in the car before work or after work, I, you know, I need that bookend being at the hospital. 
there are other times when I'm in the car where I can rock it out, you know, and sing and relive my youth with 80s big hair bands. And, you know, so there's something to be said for music for sure to inspire and energize. Pre-smartphone, there was so much more time for enjoyment. When I think about music and I think about a smartphone, you know what I miss? I miss the act of hearing a song on the radio, Mm -hmm. taking the time to go out and buy the album or the CD. Well, first it was album, cassette, CD, Mm -hmm. and then bringing it home and unwrapping it and reading all the liner notes and reading about the band or the artist and reading all the lyrics and then listening song by song to every single track. That was one of my favorite activities as a music lover. And now it's just immediate. I hear a song that I like and I download it and there it is. It's always there for me. It's that level of enjoyment of it and taking the time for myself. And I really was receiving those evenings of listening to an entire album. I was receiving that. So I think the smartphone has taken away a lot of our practice of receptivity. Yeah, anticipation, really wanting something and all those actions that you had to take to receive it, that's not there anymore. Like you said, it's instantaneous. I think it would be helpful to ask ourselves what we could receive. If I asked you that here, because you've shared before, I know you are a natural born doer. You are accomplishing tasks. You are getting it done. Yes, you're very inspired by a lot of it, but your days are full. If you asked yourself, you know, what could I receive that I might just pass on by in my day-to-day life? What could I receive as a true gift for just the sake of pleasure, for just the sake of rest? I think the biggest thing that goes around that is permission. And I mean, full permission, not like you're okay, you're allowed to do this, but encouraging myself. Um, to rest and luxuriate in it and not have any negative self-talk around it and really dive into this idea of doing less and, you know, strive for accomplishments. I would like to strive with just as much enthusiasm towards rest. Um, And I don't think I do that. It's more of an afterthought or, okay, fine. Um, but not really celebrating it. So I think offering it up as a, as a celebration or a something to really luxuriate in, I don't offer that to myself. I don't give that to myself at all. I think it's also what's coming up for me as I'm listening to you. That also sounds like a really being in the present moment. Yeah. And I, you know, with all the work that you and I have both done, you know, with our yoga practice and Ayurveda and meditation and all that, you know, I think we, we do try to be very intentional about, about being in the present moment, but we also live in this world and that's Mm -hmm. where our attention is always drawn elsewhere. And Mm -hmm. so I, I, that can derail me and take me out of the present moment. Yes. If I think about perhaps the day that I just had today where I did allow myself to have a nap because it was one of those days where I just felt bone tired today. And I noticed the old thoughts of, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. You haven't completed X, Y, and Z before earning this nap. How would have that been different for me if I was just completely present with how tired I was? If I didn't make that mean that I was weak, that's that's another thought that comes off. That's another thought that comes up for me. If I'm tired, if I feel too tired to um, do something that I had planned that I would, if I feel more tired than I wish I felt, I will resist being tired because there is some underlying belief that being tired means that I'm somehow weakened, that that I'm not tough enough, that I don't have that strength. If I would have simply been present with my body, my body is communicating with me and saying, I'm tired. I don't have to make that mean that I've done something wrong and that's why I don't have my vitality. That's, those are some other thoughts that I'll become aware of that will move through 
uh, my mind is that, oh, well, if you're tired, well, maybe you ate too late or maybe you didn't get enough hours of sleep or maybe you're still catching up because you stayed up too late watching that show two nights ago. So I'll go to all the things that I've done wrong in order to have been punished with this state of being tired rather than being alert and awake enough to do all the things. And do all the things. Yeah. So what's coming up for me in this conversation, my body is communicating with me. We're tired. I'm tired. All right. Being present with that. I had a moment to honor that today. I did take it, but probably didn't restore myself in the way that I would had I taken it as if it were a gift. Just fully, as you say, gave myself permission to give myself the gift of full non-guilt, no shame rest. And then once I felt rested, just continue on without the shame of, oh, I'm so weak because I had to, this, you know, I had to have a nap. It broke me. This day broke me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's what it comes down to is as long as we're present and the mind's not moving into what this situation might mean, depending on our specific lens and filters that we have on our lives, then we would just be able to respond to the moment in the most authentic way possible. This go, go, go and do, do, do has us passing on by so many gifts and so much of the beauty of life. A lingering kiss with somebody that you love, maybe an extra long cuddle with the kids. I think it's worth exploring and hacking into the thoughts we have about how much we think we need to achieve before we have earned pleasure. I'm up to it. I am too. Always a pleasure talking to you, my friend. Yes, you too. Love you. Love you. Thank you for listening to the Radiant Warrior podcast. If you found it valuable, please leave us a positive review to help others find it. And please check out the Radiant Warrior podcast on Instagram and Facebook to leave us your questions and find out where you can come and practice with us next.